Hi, I'm Hamish Black and welcome to Writing On Games. Here's a weird story for you, back in 2016 I made a video about Final Fantasy XV that was generally very positive. One criticism I did have, however, was of the voice acting. I thought it was awful, unnatural, sounding like every character was stiltedly shouting their lines as if they were advertising a cruise or something. Given that I now had a chance to replay the game in the recently released Royal Edition for PC, my first thought was to immediately change the audio language to Japanese. Initially, it was kinda neat. It was different, I was impressed at how the different languages seemed to be uniquely lip-synced, etc. And I lasted about 15 minutes before changing it back. In simple terms, it made things weird. Suddenly with this small change, even with everything else remaining the same, these weren't the characters I knew that I'd previously spent a whole bunch of time sitting in a car with, studying their relationship, feeling like one of a group of friends. Even though I'd previously taken issue with the way those lines were spoken, it became one of the game's many eccentricities that would come to define it for me. In short, they sounded like idiots, but they were my idiots. See, in the whirlwind of chatter surrounding the controversial Games as Service model where a game will see foundational release that will gradually be built upon, I saw Final Fantasy XV coming up a lot. It wasn't finished, I'm not going to play it until they've added more, that's the game that should have launched. And while I understand where those concerns are coming from, it didn't line up with the fact that, well, I ended up really cherishing my experience with the launch version, warts and all. While this definitive version adds a bunch of new features in an attempt to fix the problems people had, mostly they just served to highlight what made the original game tick for me. For example, the newly added multiplayer mode seemed like a fantastic idea on paper. The crux of the main game is a road trip with friends, so why not introduce your real friends into the equation? In practice, it was a dramatically pared down affair that only highlighted how important the context of the main game and the characters within it actually were. Without that, the flaws in the individual mechanics and systems became more apparent. See, the game's combat in particular was always pretty simplistic, and despite the numerous gear and customization options available, there were very few situations that you couldn't simply brute force your way through if you just held down the attack button while stocked up on healing items. But I can't say I didn't enjoy it. There was a satisfying rhythm to it all, a ballet-like spectacle that perhaps I didn't get from turn-based installments of yore. More importantly though, the ease with which I could take down my enemies lined up with the more nonchalant traits I saw in my characters, largely viewing their foes as nuisances to toy with more than genuine threats. Encounters acted as a showcase of the subtle animations illustrating the extent to which these characters have each other's backs. When you're controlling a mute, multicoloured schlub called Piss Dingo going through a checklist of hunts, the simplicity of combat can't be so contextually justified. In a vacuum, it's arguably a flaw. As part of a larger whole though, the way the combat played out helped me interpret a side to the characters not conveyed through dialogue. In that sense, sure, the multiplayer adds more to the package I guess, but all it ended up doing was make me long for that specific road trip once more. This more is better approach isn't just apparent in the modes available either. The addition of an off-road regalia model is nice as an option to more fully and quickly explore the world I suppose, but much like the flying model unlocked after the game's completion, I barely used it. I never saw my goal as one of seeing every nook and cranny of this massive world. It wasn't a place where I was thinking how I could most efficiently cut every corner. There was a part of me that enjoyed simply being a tourist, cruising through at a leisurely pace. I'd take in the stunning scenery and watch my characters interact with each other. Occasionally someone would get bored or see something in the distance and suggest we checked it out, which I always ended up doing and which helped bring some structure to the experience. I didn't need to go off road for that, and the option to do so just made me appreciate what I found so endearing about staying on the straight and narrow. More crucially, that was the story I so loved in Final Fantasy XV. That borderline character study told through off the cuff vignettes of exploration, snippets of incidental dialogue and stretches of silence where things like animations would tell the story. It was all in service of showing the growth of these boys and the bond they share. The game could literally have been get Noctis from point A to marriage B and I would have been immensely satisfied. 
Which is why it was so disappointing, both then and now, that the later chapters took this sudden turn towards focusing on the nigh incomprehensible main story, involving political conspiracies, royal lineage, crystals and the like. Apparently since release, changes have been made to the story in terms of additional cutscenes. It's novel for sure, going against the convention that post-game support can only be limited to gameplay alterations. At the end of the day though, it's still a narrative that takes the focus away from the more subtle human stories we've been experiencing in the regalia. That sees Noctis, for example, treating the trauma befalling his friends, the ones we've been controlling, as if it were nothing, while news of Luna Freya, a character we barely see, sends him spiralling into despair. In short, it's just more of a story that's still bad that no matter how much extra detail is added to it, never lined up with the game's real narrative strength, i.e. the daft road trip that facilitated it all. It's not a story that needed more, what it needed was focus. But you know what? Even the abysmal corridor crawl of chapter 13 made me truly miss my dumb anime friends and made the grand reunion all the more impactful. I mean, given how certain characters react to Noctis's strops, I could at least imagine the intent of forcing you to go it alone in order to truly appreciate those around you. Either that, or I'm clearly willing to excuse a lot for these boys. All of this is to say that Final Fantasy XV's problems are numerous, but in terms of what those problems ended up saying to me in terms of the characters, that they were merely a bunch of friends of imperfect human beings concerned only with getting through this mess together, that is what has kept me thinking about the game in such a reverent light. I didn't need all the bells and whistles attached, I either didn't notice them, as in the story editions, or their inclusion just reminded me of what I so enjoyed without them. Again, more does not always equal better. I subconsciously ended up viewing the larger game in the same way I viewed the characters within it. Its blemishes and shortcomings served to give it a distinct human identity as I saw it. Like its characters, Final Fantasy XV was, and still is, a deeply flawed journey but importantly, it was my journey. So I hope you enjoyed my piece revisiting Final Fantasy XV. If you did, maybe consider hitting subscribe as well as the little bell thingy and check out the podcast in the description. If you feel like going the extra mile, you can always check out the Patreon like these wonderful folks currently on screen. I'm forever humbled by your continued support and any pledge, no matter how small, is greatly appreciated. In particular, I'd like to thank Mark B. Writing, Michael Wolf, Artyom Vitsyuk, Spike Jones, Edward Clayton Andrews, Vasily Hrabinka, Chris Wright, Dr. Motorcycle, Harry Fuertes, Ham Migas, Travis Bennett, Zach Casserly, Samuel Pickens, Tom Nash, Shardfire, Philip Lange, Rob, Rusty Shackelford, Anna Pimentel, Jesse Ryan, Brandon Robinson, Diego Fox Obuza, Justin's Holderness, Biggie Smith, Peter, Christian Kuneman, Camel Traffic, Nico Blakely, Nicholas Ross, and Charlie Yang. And with that, I'm Hamish Black, and this has been Writing on Games. Thank you very much for watching, and I will see you next time.